let's move back out east uh, to the New York Knicks and the Miami Heat, where Butler, of course, has missed some time, but Miami still have had control of the series for the most part. I'll get your thoughts first, Tariq. How have you felt about this series so far, and do you think the Knicks have any bit of a chance of fighting back into this, or is this just Miami's trip to the Eastern Conference Finals with the writing on the wall? Um, I think Miami, um, they're they're just playing um, just their brand of basketball like that we kind of always expect from them. And, like, even in game two when Jimmy didn't play, like, they still had every chance to win that game. Like, the Knicks needed, like, Randall to have his best playoff game, I think, maybe of his career. Brunson had a big-time performance. Um, I think he scored 30. And they still barely got out of there. Like, Miami was right there. And then with Jimmy coming back, looks like he didn't miss a beat at all. Like, he's still playing like how he has been this entire postseason. Um, I just think Miami's a little too much. They got the best player on the floor, which is saying something because Jalen Brunson has been really good this postseason, but Jimmy has been that much better. So, to answer your question, I don't think the Knicks really have a chance. Um, this series could be over in 5-2, even as, like, up in the air as I was before the series started. I just think Miami is just too solid and they're playing too good of basketball right now. Their shooters are still shooting relatively well. And, you know, I see one like Kevin Love not shooting well in game two, Gabe Vincent didn't shoot, or game three. Um, Gabe Vincent didn't shoot well in game three, but I expect those guys to be better. And, you know, an AC making the conference finals was not in my deck of cards for this postseason, but it very much might happen. Yeah, I was a little bit less split when this series started. I feel like I was still, even after the Cavs series, a bit lower on the Knicks. I looked at that first round series and I was like, man, I feel like the Cavs just like totally collapsed. And not to not give credit to the Knicks because they played a really great series. But I looked at them versus Miami and I was just like, I still don't really know if I trust anybody besides Jalen Brunson. And through the first three games, Jalen Brunson showing up pretty well. But everybody else, I'm just kind of like, eh, about. But looking at Miami coming into this series, Jimmy was playing out of his mind in round one, but it was also their depth pieces that had a bit of a resurgence, like a Kyle Lowry, like a Duncan Robinson, especially Vincent and Struess playing a lot better than the regular season. And so game one ended up being a lot closer than I thought. And I thought, oh, we might have a series here, especially if Jimmy's out. But then after game two was so close and now looking at game three, it just feels like Miami kind of has their number, has really taken control. And I just don't think New York will get back into this. I mean, you look at game three and it's like, Jimmy Butler's coming off an injury. You should have every chance to win. He might be a little bit rusty, still not be 100%. And then your star player comes out and gives you 10 points. RJ, who was going to be an important piece, and then getting through this series comes out and gives you 14. It's like you need somebody else to really step up big time besides just Jalen Brunson because as good as he's been, he can't carry you by himself against a team like Miami. And it's weird to say that about an eight seed. But we all know this is not the traditional eight seed. This is a team that was in the conference finals last year with like the exact same roster, a team that was in the finals like three years ago. Like they've been here and they know how to get through. So you're going to have to play at your best if you want to take them out. And New York just isn't doing that. Game three, putting up 86 points. I mean, that's a game that Miami's regular season offense could have won. And if their playoff offense is going to continue to be one of the best in the league, you don't got a chance if you're not playing that well. Yeah, the, the Knicks are definitely in a spot where last series they matched up well with Cleveland based on how they could dominate on the glass, uh, specifically with how Randall and Mitchell Robinson were on the offensive boards, and the fact that the Cavs just didn't defend very well for a team that's normally very good defensively. Uh, they've now run into a Heat team who has managed the Knicks' good offensive rebounding ability and hasn't really let that be a significant factor and has also been very good defensively and significantly better than the Cavs were defensively, uh, where Randall, other than a game, has continued to be relatively poor in the postseason, which unfortunately seems to be a trend for him, uh, where Brunson, although has still been good, has been nowhere near as elite as he was during the first round of the playoffs, and that's no slight on him. That's just a credit to this Miami Heat defense. And the Knicks are just in a point now where they're fine, but Miami neutralized a lot of what really separated them in round one. And at the same time, this is all happening while the Knicks have just gone absolutely cold from three. They're shooting 27% from three throughout the series. They didn't shoot amazingly against the Cavs, but they shot a lot better than that. And it's, it's been rough for them this series. And this has all been happening while, sure, Miami had an elite offense in the first round. They're nowhere near that level in round two. And they're still, they still look that much 
better when you compare them to this Knicks team. They look to be the far superior team. They're only shooting 31% from three in the series. But it just looks like Miami are much more comfortable in the series than the Knicks. They have much more control moving forward. The defense is much better. The offensive flow looks better. They're a team that's been here before, and it shows. And the Knicks just look like a team that, look, getting to the second round for the Knicks is a great great season for them. That was not on the table for most people heading into this postseason. Hell, even getting into the play-in wasn't on the table for everyone for them heading into this season. But the fact that they are where they are is good. But ultimately, Miami have the experience. Miami have the better roster. And it just looks like they're set to win this one pretty comfortably for the rest of it, assuming that Jimmy stays healthy and they just walk this one out. Yeah, like, I I think maybe two of us had the Knicks in, like, the plane, and that was it. Like, we yeah. didn't really expect them to be, what, a top five seed in the Eastern Conference. So, I mean, they're definitely an over, overachieving type of season. Um, but hopefully they can build on it this time, like, in comparison to a couple of years ago where they kind of regressed. I think they will because they got the – the building block with Jalen Brunson, they made the Josh Hart trade and everything. So I think they, they'll move forward and they'll, you know, come back still a relatively good team, hopefully better. But, you know, this is just like matchups are so important in the playoffs and the Knicks are just, I mean, the, the Heat are just like a, a tough matchup for the Knicks um, in comparison to where Cleveland was kind of, maybe we didn't see it as a favorable matchup, but they were able to really dominate the boards. Miami's not really going to let that happen. Um, and they got, you know, bigger wing players in comparison to Cleveland, like we mentioned before. So it's just a tough matchup for them, man. But, you know, definitely a successful season. Even if they go out on five games, I don't think really many people had them even making it this far. Yeah, this is going to be a really interesting what's next for the Knicks if we end up doing that type of segment next week. Just because this era, like, started with Randall and Barrett as, like, the top two guys. And I'm looking at, like, how would this team be best suited moving forward? And I'm like, are one or both of them just kind of expendable at this point? Like, do you even need them around long term for this team to be as good as it can be? And I don't know the answer to that question because I I just see them like not only in their first playoff run, but in this playoff run. And I'm just like, mm-hmm. like, I don't know. But also, like, would they get anything better than that? So it's, it's an interesting question to ask. Yeah, it'll be interesting to see. Uh, the good thing for them is they do have a lot of first-round pick flexibility. I think they still have a couple of extra ones kicking around alongside most of their own. Uh, so they do have a lot of flexibility in the trade market, and they can pretty much match any salaries they want, whether it's in an R.J. Barrett uh, trade, whether it's in a Julius Randle trade, because that Evan Fournier contract still exists. And as much as that's not a favorable contract, there is only one year left of team control and combine that with Randall or Barrett's salary and your match in salaries for any star. So they have the means to make the trade pretty easily. And as much as people have concerns about, like, is Julius Randall's contract bad? He's only making $25.6 million next year, which for a guy who's been as productive as he has in today's NBA is not absurd. And it's not amazing, but it's, it's not terrible value, uh, especially if you just look at the regular season production. And RJ Barrett's set to make $24 million next year, which, again, is not amazing value, but is not absolutely outrageous either. So uh, they have some flexibility there. So they'll, they'll definitely be a team to look at if a Kawhi or a Paul George becomes available via trade. That's potentially the team that you could look to see make a move to pair along Jalen Brunson. So uh, they'll definitely be a team that will be interesting to see actually truly have a chance at potentially making one of those trades, not just being in the rumors because it's the Knicks. Yeah, having options is definitely a good thing. You know? So it's good It's good that they got that flexibility. They also got like some maybe young pieces, like if like a really big level star does become available too. So, you know, they got a lot of wiggle room to get better. Um, not just hopefully they just don't regress like they did last time. But, you know, this front office has made some like very sound decisions, I would say, since like the new regimes come in. So, you know, I got faith that, you know, they'll make the right decisions when the time comes. But hopefully they don't just try and do something for the sake of doing it, like just making a bad trade that's, you know, not really, you know, making them that much better. But maybe it's like a big name, but, you know, an older guy or something like that. 